Today's workshop is Mentoring Reimagined, a key to connection, community, and legacy building, building and is brought to you by Louisa Branscombe. And she has uh, with her several panelists, Jeff Daughtry, Katrina Brake, Jeanette Williams, and Lillane Kimbrough. I hope I pronounced that correctly. <laughs> Uh, this workshop is brought to you by IBMA's Leadership Bluegrass Alumni Committee. My name is Lee Stivers. I'm the co-chair of that committee, along with Michelle Gorley. Somebody needs to mute their mic. Um, uh, and I just want to mention that we continue our series with one more uh, presentation, and that will be on April 16th. And that is entitled Finding Peace music as a wayfinder for grief and loss. And that is being presented by Chris Digman and Michelle Gorley. So stay tuned for details on that, uh, the final one of our season. Um, before, I, before I introduce um, Louisa and turn things over to her, just a couple of housekeeping items. Um, this presentation, this uh, workshop is being recorded and it will be posted shortly on IBMA's YouTube channel. Um, your mics should all be muted, and my text should be muted. Uh, your mic should remain muted throughout the, the presentation, but we do encourage you to type in questions and comments uh, into the chat, and we'll, we'll have a Q&A time um, at the end of the presentation. And finally, you may want to choose the speaker view in uh, in your Zoom layout there so that you are seeing the, the speaker as opposed to the gallery. That's just kind of a nice way to watch these, these workshops. So uh, let me just introduce Louisa. Louisa Branscombe uh, is the founder and director of Woodsong Songwriter Retreats, which is currently in its 34th year. Um, she received the IBMA Distinguished Achievement Award for furthering bluegrass through pioneering work in community building, songwriting, and advocacy for women and songwriters. Um, she's received awards from the American Psychological Association, the Georgia Psychological Association, uh, the Alabama Bluegrass Hall of Fame, Georgia Country Music Hall of Fame. Um, she uh, won an award for Song of the Year, um, for well, several Song of the Year awards, um, and is a founding member of IBMA's Songwriter Committee. Uh, I think with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Louisa. Thank you very much. And thank you all for this opportunity to share something that I dearly love with people I dearly love. Um, this uh, little gathering or, of ideas is the culmination of um, my interest in mentoring and teaching and, and connecting with others in that way. And uh, the pivotal point was when um, Alison Krauss recorded Steel Rails, and I uh, felt like I had had that pinnacle moment that all songwriters aspire to, and we aren't always so lucky, and I was very lucky. And um, I, I thought at that moment that I wanted to pay it forward, and I thought the best way to do that was um, to create something or think about something that wasn't there when I was playing. I wanted to fill that hole. So in the 70s and 80s, I ra rarely saw people I would identify as like me. Mentoring was not a thing. Um, and uh, of course, we didn't have media, social media. So uh, with that, let me jump right into screen sharing. Don't look at my dirty pictures, y'all. Hold on. Okay. So let me, do looks good, Louisa. Full, let me do full screen. Um, and we'll be ready to rock and roll. Okay. <clears throat> I'm going to let the slides do the talking here. This is work that I'm doing in preparation for a manuscript. And so I do ask uh, the courtesy of checking with me before you use any of the ideas or particularly in print. Uh, the presentation has three parts and today we're only doing part one, which is overview and vision of what this model is, how it came into being and how I think it can be useful for all of us, no matter what you do, where you are in bluegrass. So in the beginning, in terms of our loves and passions, 
we start out as a blank slate. And then gradually <clears throat> along our journey, we discover our passions, which could be any of these things or many more things. And if we're lucky, one of those is bluegrass. And typically we proceed along a developmental continuum in the things we love from beginner to novice, to competence, to mastery, to what I call sage. And um, sage is generally an elder, but it could also be someone of any age who has really developed such proficiency and understanding um, of their unique gifts uh, that they can offer. And for example, here are some early stages in that journey. Some people you'll recognize, my daughter you might not, there she is. And when people work really hard, we can aspire to some of the masters in our genre, which I randomly put pictures of here. Some still with us, some no longer with us. And you'll see that mentors, of course, are not just musicians, most notably not just musicians. So we have those typical uh, passages in the journey, but there is one more that usually isn't talked about that I'm here to talk about. And what that means is beyond our learning, um, we can pass on our passions to others and we can do it in all these ways, informal exchange, hanging out behind the stage, formal teaching, classroom, workshops, all kinds, media and apprenticeships, but also through what we call mentoring. And mentoring is a hot topic right now, worthy of my wonderful artwork. And the reason it's a hot topic, I think, and a very, very important topic, if I think one of the most important things we should even be thinking about right now, is because we have the first large cohort of youngsters in bluegrass, the baby boomers, are now the senior members of the field, and there are many more of us. We have a bigger uh, level in the, in the pyramid uh, in this new generation. And so we have a chance to leave a lot of knowledge. Second, new influences in bluegrass have extended beyond the, the previous scope of the genre and the previous historical narrative. And this gives us a chance to preserve both tradition and creativity through mentoring. Third, the need to recognize, include, and preserve all the diverse voices in the historical narrative. And I'm paraphrasing from the words of, words of Michelle Conchison in a recent uh, LBG dialogue. Um, I think this is such a beautiful way of saying it, all verses in the historical narrative of, of bluegrass. And lastly, the chance to preserve the gifts of the masters, elders, and sages you know, of our time. In other words, I believe we have uh, certainly a genre imperative, if not a moral imperative, to preserve the legacy of, um, I gotta move you guys where I can read my whole slide. Okay, uh, the legacy of all those, especially the elders in all aspects of the business and performance in a way that honors, values, and includes all perspectives, voices, and cultural identities. But alas, all traditional def definitions and models of teaching, apprenticing, uh, coaching, and mentoring, if you look them up, are defined hierarchically between an expert and a recipient. They focus on knowledge and skills as the only currency of the transaction. They omit relative, uh, sorry, relational and student variables. And they define the interaction as a one-way street, non-parallel, teacher to student, and they do not acknowledge values as part of what makes the transaction work, such as community, diversity, and the value of minority voices. So I feel like we need a new consensual definition of mentoring and approach that is based on research and systematic analysis of effective mentoring methods. I mean, certainly any, we can all uh, 
uh, do mentoring and we can do it spontaneously at any time. But I think it's also helpful to have some consensual um, agreement on what it means and how we can reproduce it in effective ways. So the scientific side is it needs to be replicable, reliable, and flexible. And I think it's helpful to clarify mentoring and reflect in a way that reflects the current goals and values of the genre and serves our ideals of connection, inclusivity, and legacy leaving and helps extend the knowledge, belonging, and purpose to others through those it reaches. And so we can promote a collective narrative. In other words, again, amazing artwork. It, we want to move for something from something that looks like this, the expert up here on the seesaw, who's going blah, 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 to the student who's going, where's my cell phone? To something that looks like this, two equal participants, one presume, presumably with more experience, in an equal dialogue that is reciprocal and cyclical, and where both people feel like equal members of the exchange. And that's where I came up with the Branscombe Mentor Method, the goal of which is to clarify and re redefine mentoring so that it can reflect these goals, a consensual definition, a replicable and reliable method, creativity and expanded connection in the community and non-competitiveness, relationship, inclusivity, and diversity, service to a, a historical narrative that is a tapestry of all voices, preservation of the legacy, and the contributions of the individual legacies through mentoring. This approach comes from three streams in my, uh, the sort of the stepping stones that led me here. One is I did research in mutuality and power and ethics and professional relationships for about 10 years in psychology, uh, particularly non-parallel relationships. That's what like a doctor, patient, lawyer, client, teacher, student, non-parallel relationships. And we learned that they are more successful, more la lasting, and produce deeper change when the client or student experiences mutuality, agency, or power, and an equal voice. So we learned that. And I also studied creativity and transformation from 1988 to the present. Um, and I learned through working with people with trauma and others that healing and learning are maximized when the um, recipient experiences a shift in their own journey. Okay, so I can say, well, I learned how to rhyme in the song, or I can say that experience moved me to a different level as a creative artist. Those are two different things. And three, I have analyzed feedback forms, which being a little scientist, I have been collecting from 1989 to the present. So that's about 800 students, 80% return, approximately 600 feedback forms. And in all of that, those feedback forms, it was striking to me that no one talked about didactic knowledge. No one talked about the facts they learned. No one talked about how to rhyme or anything like that or even how to have the best song. They talked about these factors we're, we've been talking up, about up here, community, mutuality, agency. I'm also informed by my own experiences in bluegrass, which in the 70s typically looked like this. Not that it isn't great to be surrounded by Jerry Douglas and Ricky Skaggs, and I think that's Daryl Wolf, but um, I didn't see mentors or people who I could identify with, who I could reach out to or who reached out to me um, as a woman playing the banjo and fronting a band and writing songs in those days. Here are the highlights of this method, mutuality and reciprocity. Um, it's person focused rather than competitive. You don't get grades. It values individual contribution and diverse voices, balanced engagement, equal voice of the participant, experiential learning, sustainability, it's open-ended non-cognitive factors in success, and responsibility to build community during after, during and after the mentoring. So it's part of the mentoring to foster this sense that that person has something valuable to go ahead and do and take back to the community. Just like we teach in uh, Leadership Bluegrass, it isn't what you know, it's what you do with what you know. Or as Gene Houston said, what do you do after your resurrection? You take it back to the community. 
And you can do this from any point in your journey. You don't have to be a sage. Mentoring is not classroom teaching panels or workshops where the agenda is set by the teacher and the students are passive. Although these are valuable forms of learning that can be enhanced by incorporating these values, values and principles. And mentoring relationships can grow out of all these settings. Mentoring is any interaction between someone with more experience and a mentee, which I call a participant because it's equal, in which the agenda and goals are set by the participant or both. The focus is on the participant and who they are, their personhood. What's important to you right now? What's going on? Did you just lose your mother? And goals that are relevant to their unique personal journey and the participant has an equal voice. Now, where does it happen? Experiential retreats and workshops are ideal. Planned meetings or spontaneous exchanges anywhere. Coffee house, checkout lane, and the principles of this mentor, mentor method can enhance mentoring and promote these values for both sides. And anytime you mentor, you're losing, you're using, ah, anytime you mentor, let's try that again, you're leaving your legacy. See, that would not be a good songwriter line if you get tongue tied like that. But the part leaving your legacy, that's good. Okay, so the takeaway, pass on your passions by mentoring. And we can strive toward a community that re reflects compassion and mindfulness about including all voices and all talent levels. Because what we do today is the legacy of tomorrow. We're creating legacy right this minute. And the whole point is we're all just walking each other home. And here are a few scenes from the Woodsong workshops where we do mentoring uh, here and also with individuals out of the workshops. Spontaneous gatherings. Here's uh, Paul Simon's accordion player. He happened to be at the restaurant. So what did we do? Guys, what do we do in bluegrass? We jam. Uh, we do performances for the community with our songwriters. We involve our horses. Here's some young mentorees. We jam. <laughs> Oldest mentoree so far, oldest participant is my dad. He was 89. He was also my first mentor. And he wrote a great song about mom who had died. <clears throat> and I just want to acknowledge uh, this. There's a typo here, but the staff and songwriters of 35 years of Woodsong retreats, also uh, our activities in the first songwriter committee, which uh, were orga organized around these same principles. The songwriter committee was a trying ground for this very thing originally. And also the black blues players in a dark bar in Birmingham in 1964 in the middle of the riots who shared their legacy with a skinny white 12 year old girl and her dad and showed the meaning of inclusive and what music is all about. So uh, that's my uh, description of, of what this method is and why I think it's useful and why I want to encourage everybody to think of themselves as a mentor all the time, especially reach out to those who might be shy about reaching out to you. And that's what I've got to say. I, I just want to also say, Lee, should I say a little bit about my panelists or would you? like to. You know, why, don't, why don't you go ahead and introduce your panelists and get that discussion going. And while that's happening, again, folks, um, we encourage you to, to type in comments, questions, or whatever into the chat, and we'll get to those. Okay, yeah. Um, they're all scattered out, but here's Jeff Dougherty. And Jeff uh, has attended the workshop recently and um, is a mandolin player and plays with uh, Mike Mitchell's band right now, but a lot of folks and uh, has done a whole lot to represent bluegrass in um, international settings. Um, and I'm gonna ask each of you, I think, uh, or maybe just as we go, Jeff, can you say a few sentences about uh, what mentoring means to you or anything inspired by you from this presentation? No, no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> well, I, Thanks, I think, <laughs> uh, I would say my view of mentorship and mentoring really changed after um, attending your retreat 
uh, was it last year? I think it was. Um, because it always has been, you know, that hierarchy. Um, it, I never felt equal to a mentor until then. Um, and it's it's always been extremely important to me um, to further my knowledge, either by, you know, the classroom setting or just speaking to someone more experienced, um, which is a lot of people. Um, so this, yeah, thank you, Louisa, <laughs> for showing me personally that, that it can be um, equal. Um, and that has totally changed every workshop that I've given every lesson that I, you know, have the opportunity to do. Um, I, I'm, I'm no longer, you, you know, the, the know-it-all um, because I learn just as much from the participant as I hope they get from me. Well, I, you're, you're so articulate about those things and thank you. And I, <laughs> I think you, you highlighted something else, which is mentors, true mentors are always growing. Uh, you know, it's a vanishing point, what we're aiming towards. So thank you, Jeff. And we'll come back to more discussion. I, I think we'll have time. Um, I appreciate the ways that you interact with others because you, uh, you seem ready to give knowledge that you have, but you do it in a very gracious way. So you're, you're very talented as a mentor, I think. Oh, shucks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but you haven't signed up for the next retreat yet. <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay. Uh, uh, Jeanette's next on my screen, screen and um, so honored that Jeanette has been on the staff of Woodsong Retreats for at least 10 years and is one of my close friends. Uh, she brings so much in terms of um, her gracious um, mutual approach to people she touches and interacts with, with her, her particular um, Places she's a sage, and that would include singing, um, fronting bands, understanding songs, writing songs, producing songs, and uh, bringing people into bluegrass, um, uh, emceeing. She's also very good at that. Um, she's been playing bluegrass a long time and won quite a few honors as a vocalist as well as a songwriter. Um, and I'm just thinking, Jeanette, what would you like to kind of add on to where we are here in the conversation? Well, first I'd like to say thank you for inviting me to be uh, on the Zoom call today. I really appreciate being included and uh, I really appreciate your whole outline of your, your whole process. Um, as you said, I've been doing this for over, Johnny and I have been touring over 33 years and um, I have been so fortunate and feel blessed to have met many, many of my heroes in the music. And uh, I think probably this is the only music, well, it's the only music that I've ever been really active in, but um, the people that I have met, that I have looked up to, have generally been very gracious in sharing their knowledge and helping. So I just wanna pass that along. I think it's a great model. And um, I've never, uh, until we started, working with you on your workshops, we never really considered it as mentoring. It, it was just what you did. You just, if there's someone who has a question, you answer the question or you have a conversation or you, you ask the question. And uh, most of the time, you know, the, the people would, would help you. And so that's just the right thing to do. And um, I think that that kind of just sums it up and we all help each other. We, you were all walking each other home, as you said. So um, it's a really great model. And as Jeff said, I, I know that you bring us on as staff, but um, we learn as much from the participants as they do from us. So it is, is, it is a back and forth exchange, which I think is a great model. I, I, yeah, I wanna highlight that last part and um, the, that we learn as much from the participants. A lot of songwriter workshops, and this could be any any uh, part of the profession, <laughs> any profession, uh, say you got to be at this level, and there's a lot of emphasis on, you know, the level that you're at for that workshop, whatever level it is. And I purposefully um, solicit and have people at all different levels because 
I find that it's just amazing how fresh and accurate and right on the perception of, of a student or a men, mentoree or participant in our case uh, can be. Um, they, they will hit the nose on the head, you know, uh, when they hear a song in ways that some of us, we got all this piled up knowledge can't do. So it has taught me to keep my ears open to, to everyone all the time and what they have to say. Thanks, Jeanette. Okay, so I'm going to roll down here to Leah Lane. Uh, Leah has, let's see, Leah is, she's an outstanding songwriter who is too uh, loaded down with children, grandchildren, and work, and all kinds of things, uh, perhaps to go out and be leading a band, but she's been such a um, uh, stellar and valuable part of our workshops because of her ability to capture not only what relationships are about in the workshops and be a part of that, but the heart of songwriting and the heart of anything. And I think that's how I'd introduce you, Leah. And what would you like to jump in? Thank you. And well, I, I thank you for asking me to do this. I'm definitely a fish out of water. Um, the first workshop I attended was about eight years ago. I think we decided um, my sister, Kat Brake, who's on the panel, um, took me to the workshop and we, I, I had never written a song. I had written poems as a release. That's how I got things off my mind right. to calm myself down. Um, and Katrina said, let's, you know, Katrina was a musician. She said, let's go, let's go do something with it. So we went to the workshop. I knew Louisa was a award-winning songwriter. I didn't know she was an award-winning psychologist. Um, I was at a dark place when I went there. Louisa and Johnny and Jeanette all worked with us on a level I had never experienced. Like she said, it was parallel. They were our, they became our friends, our mentors. They helped us. Um, I took away from the workshop that from Louisa that it was much better to write a song about burning my house down than it was to actually burn my house down. <laughs> and um, in trying to write those songs, one, uh, the year of several months after we went to the first workshop, Johnny and Jeanette were in Tampa at the state fair performing. And Johnny met us in a back room over <laughs> under the stands at the um, fairgrounds and helped me work on a song that I had started at the workshop. So we learned right then that, that they cared about us so much more than just the time at that workshop. And they've helped us do so many things. And um, we, we've just taken away so many friendships and um, life lessons learned from all of them. And it's, we, it's part of the best things of our lives right now, I think. And I think uh, when I, what I've learned about that concept sustainable is because people like Leah and Kat have come back Year after year, I have two people who I haven't seen in three years who are coming back again this year. So sustainable, when you have a way of teaching that's open-ended and is person-centered, it can be recurring and sustainable. And, uh, and going back to what Jeanette said, um, I think so many people are natural mentors. You don't have to have a system like this. I just think that there's so much discourse that is sort of scattered around about what mentoring is. It's nice to pull it together in a cohesive manner. And I believe it's critical that we emphasize our values um, and the genre's interest in promoting the values mentioned in this model. Um, so I think that maybe these kinds of ideas can make us mindful of how we're mentoring. Um, but it's happened since, I'm sure, from day one in Bluegrass. Um, Leah, I'm so glad you haven't burned your house down, and I'm glad we got I that haven't. song finished just in time. <laughs> I, I do want to say one other thing I've taken from the lesson, from, from the mentoring. The only way I mentor anyone is probably through grandchildren that I'm raising, but things we've learned through the workshops have helped me to work with them, and our connection through songs has helped us through a lot of problems, and I'm, I'm, tr I'm trying to teach them to do the same thing when you're upset, write about it, get it out and express it. And it's it's really helped us a lot. So what you're saying is like um, this 
a, a relationship built on these values yes it doesn't have to be just mentoring it can be parenting yes. and that it is powerful in itself and transformative so, yes very good and i love the story about johnny under the bleachers yeah <laughs> because <laughs> i think wonderful. mentoring you know mentoring is a is a commitment it's it's a commitment to a person it's a relationship that you know and they don't always work out and there are risks inherent in mentoring at, at a deep level like this but um but relationship is the most powerful change uh, change agent I think that we have other than love. And we're sort of combining those when we're mentoring about something we love. And um, I want to get on down here to Katrina Brake. And uh, Kat uh, came to the workshop about starting about eight years ago. She's come to most everyone since. Um, and since coming to the workshop, some of the things that I know that she's been doing, she's active in state bluegrass organizations in Florida. She's active in mentoring um, other youngsters. She very much focuses on that when she's at festivals. Um, she is particularly interested in helping her granddaughter, Morgan Brake, who is a, very much a rising star in bluegrass. She's learned so much about the business. And also, um, you know, I think it's, it's so gratifying to me, I don't even know how to talk about it, the way that in this model I have found, um, you know, if we can sort of think of ourselves as equal to those we're working with and remember uh, the sort of the humility that, that we're all the same, um, I find people jump in and help me too. And you're one of the people who's jumped in and helped me too. So thank you, Kat. Um, what words of wisdom would you like to add? Oh, I'd never have words of wisdom, but I have lots of words. Uh, and uh, I enjoy sharing what I've learned uh, when I encourage Leah to come up to the first workshop. Uh, it was with much trepidation on her part. Uh, and uh, I think through Claire Lynch, we had come across your name. And of course, as you've mentioned, uh, eight years later, we feel like we have grown as individuals, uh, as people. We have improved our community. Uh, and uh, everywhere I go, I run into people from workshops and it's it's genuinely like running into family uh, and I think uh, there are a lot of things the organizations I've participated in where you don't have that sense of community that you've created through these workshops and I have always been excited to learn new things and to share what I learn and most of the what I guess we're talking about mentoring here. Uh, to me, it's just a sharing of what you know. Uh, I find so many opportunities to do that, whether it's someone sitting next to me at a festival or, or someone who calls me who has a young artist and they say, hey, I know uh, Morgan put out an EP and I've got these questions. First thing I do is say, go find someone who knows a lot about it. But then this is what I know. This was my experience and all our experiences are different. So my answer may not be the best for, for another person, but I can share that experience with them. And then they can take that along with learning from other people and decide their best course because it's not the same path for everyone. Each path is different. Yeah, I think that's beautifully said. And I want to ask you guys, <clears throat> since y'all are my quality control, um, does the mission or the, <clears throat> does the workshop successfully get across that you have a job to take what you've learned <clears throat> back to the community or take back to the community your talents? Does it, I feel that's such an important part. And that's where we make legacy leaving active, an active verb. Does, is it there? Am I, should I pound that in a little more? You guys are, <laughs> um, is it, is it coming across? Is it the service ethic or the network ethic and the, that the workshop doesn't end when the workshop ends? I think that comes across very well. Um, I mean, it was, you know, like a light switch. I, I instantly wanted more students to connect with on a deeper level. 
Um, I wanted to write with more, you know, not, not a seasoned writer. Um, I, I, I think you're doing a great job at portraying that at least for myself. Malvina is, says it's coming in loud and strong. Thank you, Mal. <laughs> <laughs> um, also want to acknowledge Nancy Posey who's here and who is uh, very active as a bluegrass writer and songwriter and just completed a dissertation that's very much focused on mentoring. So she's definitely my quality control, but see, she's got a mic off, so she can't know. Um, we talk about these things a lot. And I particularly love talking about mentoring moments. And, uh, you know, if we were a group where we could all jump in right here, uh, I'd love that to hear some of people's mentoring moments. But since we uh, don't have mics for everyone, uh, just to maybe you guys on the panel, highlight some of those that have happened to you. I mean, it could be uh, 10 minutes, uh, you know, you, it could be you notice someone is not quite able to be in the center of the jam, right? It could be uh, someone who is new at IBMA. It could be um, going to a school and, and looking for kids who might want to learn to play through one of our school programs. Um, it, mentoring is really an attitude, I think. Um, I, I feel it's helpful to articulate it more clearly since it's sort of a rambling discussion these days, which was my goal was to do that. But um, it's really an attitude. I think it's an attitude of sharing. It's an attitude of listening. And the research in the non-parallel relationships is very big on showing um, that when people feel listened to, uh, they have, there's better outcomes in the, in the interaction, in the work that's being uh, focused on and uh, in terms of satisfaction on both sides. So I think the attitude, uh, mentoring is an attitude. And it's also this model, I think, inspires me to keep working on myself as a mentor because I think we can always all work on, um, now how, how can I be even clearer in the way I listen to each person as an individual? What are the screens that are keeping me from listening to this person as an individual? What are my biases? Um, am I doing anything about them? Um, and, you know, always aspiring to be good examples, good role models and good teachers. And, and then I'll say one other thing about, you know, the third set of life. So you got your first set and your second set, you know, your first sets, your beginnings, your second sets, you know, you're, you're doing your career. Your third set is what's happening to all us baby boomers. That is what do we do in the last third of our life? And I feel this is just such an extraordinary, wonderful tool or approach or thing we can focus on is legacy. I think we all uh, can leave a legacy. We all have something to leave. And so this model is, is kind of one way of thinking about how to do that. And it's a win-win, right? Because when you leave what you know, and, and you know something, everybody knows something, everybody's been particularly interested in something, and they know more than lots of people about that, no matter the age and no matter uh, what your awards or your status, anything like that. And, uh, you know, so, so it's, so I think you shouldn't sell yourself. I see Annie nodding to a lot of this, Annie Beach. You know, I, you shouldn't sell yourself short on that you can be a mentor. And, and, and one way we do that in, at Woodsong is, you know, we have a lot of activities where everybody is encouraged to speak up and, and you can't put yourself down because if you do, I throw this sock monkey on the floor and it makes a loud, horrible noise. And so uh, it's, it's about recognizing that you have some value. I mean, I felt like an imposter even coming on today. So we're always working with those, those, um, little grinches on our shoulders, but uh, we encourage everybody to speak out. Everybody has an opinion about that song. And pretty soon by the end of the second day, everybody's jumping in like they've been critiquing songs forever and they, they have great things to offer. And besides, remember people on the radio or, you know, when you perform, they don't, they're not expert songwriters. They're there to have an enjoyable experience. So having people who, who uh, are not 
have it, you know, they're earlier on the continuum of learning, those, those perspectives are very, very valuable and fresh. What other thoughts are coming to mind? I don't want to structure you guys. You guys got to do some of the work yourself. <laughs> um, we are, we do have other thoughts or memories. Less, oh, sorry. Any questions? But, well, let me let me feed you a question here from the chat. Um, the someone asked about what um, what things might be different or at least special in mentoring in music generally and blue, bluegrass specifically. I think is a great question. And I think that mentoring in bluegrass and music, um, it's like a magic thread because it takes place in many different environments and the events are made up of all different kinds of people. And we mix and match. We see someone at one festival and then again later. And uh, secondly, because I think art inspires us all. We're so lucky to have, you know, to be involved in something we love. I mean, Lee, you said something about that yesterday. You know, I'm doing this because I love it. I don't have to do this. And um, and so we, when you're inspired and when you're passionate, that's when you ought to, you know, have those mentor moments or think of yourself as a mentor. And so that's the art that we do. So that's two things. And I'm not sure I'm hitting the nail on the head, but, um, uh, or as I said earlier, hitting the nose on the head. <laughs> um, and so I think it's the nature of the sustainability of the community, the mix and match, and the fact that as a genre, we are dedicated to certain things that make up our music, and we're all here to promote those things, the, and, and by that I mean the traditional things and the create more creative things, and so I think Mentoring is a way to sort of channel and focus all of those sort of intentions and possibilities in music. And also I think because we're multi-generational, you know, so I remember sitting down with, with Shannon uh, Slaughter's daughter because she, she said she wanted to learn to write a song. We were in an Alabama, I guess it was the Alabama Hall of Fame thing. And she sat down on a guitar case and, and we wrote a song. And I just said, well, so what's going on with you? And then help her pick out the hook and a few ideas and got a song. So mentoring, um, the reason mentoring in this framework is transformative is because you are inviting the person to sort of descend down on the vertical continuum into what's really important with them and then channel that into their work whether it's mixing or recording or, or writing, what their work is. And these are the things that I think help promote that. These elements in this model, I think, help promote that. That someone feels comfortable enough to really drop down into the, the little wellspring. You know, every river, every river starts with a spring bubbling up in the ground. And if you can get down to that level with someone if you're doing your best to listen and uh, be appreciative of who that person is. It comes across, and I think it promotes uh, more of what Leah typically talks about, about transformation. Um, a person is really moved. They don't just learn something. That's what mentoring is. Someone else asked about... Um... Expand, uh, expanding on the idea of risks of mentoring, I think that's partly what you're you're talking about here already. But and that that kind of hit a, a note with me because in my work as a teacher in my profession, it it I found it became much harder when you bring the the student the participant up to your same level. Suddenly, your job gets harder. Uh, it's it's a tremendously important topic and uh, it's part of my sort of when I do all three parts of this it's part of the next part but but let me say something about that I, my observations about that and y'all might have others um anytime you deepen a relationship you deepen the potential for hurt in that relationship we're not just deepening the potential for um positive transformation so I think it does take some mindfulness about the power that we have with the other person and the importance of these, this kind of context, this kind of environment we're talking about. 
And uh, and maybe for me, it's always a lesson in sort of giving up my power, if that makes sense. Um, that is when I find there is less less risk uh, that there will be a, a painful interaction or misunderstanding. Um, I also try to practice active listening that there's a lot of back and forth. I can certainly get on a soapbox. Everybody here from Woodsong knows that. But when I sit down to focus and listen, I think as long as I'm really listening to that person and what they have to say and asking a lot of questions, is this what you mean? Where do you want to go in your life? How do you feel about where you're at right now? And keeping it focused on that person, there's less risk that the power I have as the more experienced person in the transaction. I mean, we have to be aware of that first. We have to be aware we have more power. And that that's some of my research is when you have more power, you know, what are the kinds of things that can be hurtful in, in a non-parallel relationship? And so the risks are that someone get, get there is a misunderstanding or the relationship takes a turn. Um, it, it, it never happened to me in psychology. I never had a situation. I never had a complaint or a bad ending in psychology in my role as a therapist. And I think it was because I did strive towards some of these things try to make the person feel they're equal in the interaction. I'm not the expert in the room. They are about them. And I think that in mentoring and, and music, there are the potential for risk. Um, you can be misunderstood. The things you're teaching can be misheard. Um, there's, there's also, I've talked with Nancy Posey, who's here, about, you know, there's stages of a mentoree. There's stages of the participant in moving forward. And there's a point where participants usually want to break away. They want to individuate from you. And those situations don't always look pretty. Um, they're hard to negotiate. And I think good, good communication is the key to it. Most often there's not a problem. Uh, but occasionally a person needs to sort of push you away to... Uh, move towards their own level of competence. And, and I try to uh, accept that, you know, we, we can raise our kids, but then they leave home. We can write our songs, but then they leave home. We, we don't have that power forever. We didn't really have a whole lot of it in the beginning. We just want to be a little part of their journey. Um, so those are some of the risks. Uh, there, there's a risk we get hurt. You know, there's a risk we get hurt. There's a risk that the mentor he feels... Um, feels misunderstood, that we don't, um, we aren't able to meet the needs that they came to us with. And I think that the best solution to all of those things is, is going in an interactive, mindful manner in the discourse along the way. <clears throat> Let's see, I see something, you're also talking about the needs, uh, it went away. Let's no, it's she. He says you're also talking about the needs to set and recognize boundaries in a mentoring relationship, and then I'll link that with some other comments of, um, you know, you could you can put a time frame on mentorship, um, or even just beginning. You know, you find out, think about who you want as a mentor, and just go ask them. You know, what's what do you have to lose? Yes, and you can say, can you help me in some way? What what way works for you to the mentor? And uh, because certainly we we built in mentoring very consciously into the first iteration of the songwriter committee. Um, and uh, we did some of that online and some of that at IBMA. And so there are certainly many precedents for mentoring virtually. I've done a lot of that actually. And um, as well as the more spontaneous things we're talking about there. I don't know if that person meant psychological boundaries. Um, I avoid that word because I, in bluegrass, I've tried to hide sort of the whole time that, that I'm a psychologist. Actually, today, I sort of feel like it, I'm coming out, <laughs> but only because it's been so important and, in, in, you know, <laughs> how, I, how I've formed this model. I, I'm trying to use everything I've learned along the way, and the two have now woven together, and I teach songwriting and mentor. Um, so boundaries are important. You know, you, you have to realize the relationship's always about them. It's not about you. They're going to take. They're there to take. Now, they will give. Mentors give so much through the transaction. But the agenda is for 
uh, mentor is to, to take from you. That's the whole point. And so we have to be, have our own boundaries to protect ourselves with boundaries, you know, around the time that we do it and, and when we do it. If you're doing it at a deeper level, really need to be conscious of where you're at. Um, we don't, well, I don't particularly think it involves sharing a whole lot of your personal feelings and experiences. And I think it should be more focused on the other person. I think there's a place for sharing our own stories. Like if I have a panel of the experts at a workshop, but I try to stay focused on the, on the participant, the mentoree. And, and it doesn't shift y'all. I mean, to me, it's just like a client relationship. We change the transaction so that now I'm friends with Jeff. I'm friends with you know, Kat and Leah, we're definitely friends, but inside of me, I'll always be a mentor. Inside of me, I'm, I, I jumped into a consciousness where I'm the mentor, they're the mentoree. I'm always interested in how they're doing, where, where they're at in their lives with respect to music. It never goes away. Um, I probably couldn't make it go away if I wanted to. So that does set me up to be hurt if somebody, you know, they want to end the friendship or, go off in another direction or we have a disagreement or it, it can happen. Not, not every mentor is a perfect match for every mentoree either. People mentor in all different kinds of styles. Well, do we have in the audience any more questions or comments? We've got a couple of comments that I want to touch on, but uh, any other questions for Louisa or the panelists? Type them into the chat. While, while people are doing that, I want to... Yeah, I mean, I just, also, I wanted to say, Lee, if I can, uh, the we do have a, a workshop coming up. I almost forgot to mention it. Um, a Woodsong workshop that's going to be taking place in Asheville in April. If anyone's interested or you want to send any of your songwriting students our way, they can come at any level. I have two student scholarships. So um, I'd love to have anybody who's interested in, in that. And Jeanette will be on the faculty. So, yeah. Thanks, Lee. Here's a question. What can a participant slash mentoree do to help facilitate the mentoring relationship? Yeah, so on the participant side. You know, your your interest in what you love does it all for me. Um, just just bring it. You know, bring bring what you love, bring your interest, bring your questions, bring your enthusiasm. Because that energy, that that makes me energized. And uh, uh you know, I I think it's always nice to hear what works and, and what doesn't work because all of the feedback forms I've studied all these years, I, I, look, I, I redesign every workshop or tweak it according to what students are telling me. So give um, your mentor or teacher feedback. Say what worked, say what didn't work, say what you need. Um, you know, uh, um, appreciation is, is always nice. I get so much gratification from just the experience and seeing people grow. Um, I'm almost like, what? <laughs> when someone has appreciation, that's really icing on the cake. So we don't have a hard stop to this meeting. We're coming up to the end of the hour, but uh, we still have some time for people's comments. Donna, um, my friend Donna in Portland, wants to know how often your Woodsong workshops are held. Typically two times a year, spring and fall. There's one coming up on April. I think it's the 19th. We're starting on Friday. Um, and we usually do one in the fall. Asheville's beautiful in the spring and the fall. I used to do four a year. That was a lot. Oh, but I do do Zooms in between. And I also do um, ongoing mentorships through uh, virtual means. Uh, a lot of times I like to meet with a person at least once, but then, and I review their songs and I, I learn a lot about where they're at, who they are. You know, you how can you teach somebody to write a song when you haven't even stopped to figure out who they are? This is mystifying to me. Um, so I think starting with uh, letting them talk, letting the person talk, I, I always start with that. You know, where are you at? What's happening with your interest in music? And if they care to share what's happening in your life, what, who do you want to be as an artist? It's very artist focused. It's not, here's what I have to teach you. The craft and all that, that we do that when we're critiquing the songs. And I also do, you know, refresher courses and things like that. But mentoring is not that. Workshops that teach craft are not mentoring, in my opinion. <laughs> That's just my view. 
How can people contact you for personal mentorship? Um, just uh, my email is br uh, Music at gmail. Uh, I have a website, has my email on that. Facebook is a good way. And I have a private group for anyone interested in, in uh, our activities. Our network probably has, oh, hundreds of people in it. <laughs> you, you know, you anywhere you go, IBMA, SURFA, SPIGMA, Bluegrass Festivals, you run into Woodsong friends everywhere. And, and that's uh, one of the great things about this model is it's, it's about expanding and creating network, the spider effect. But it's it's sure great to see friends that you've had this particular co connection with anywhere. I put your email in the chat as well. Um, we have lots of comments, Luis, that just thanking you for what, um, you know, the message that you're bringing to us and the way you're presenting it. But I, I there's Debbie Hall writes this and I, I, I want to make sure this we read this out. Louisa, we've never met. However, your transparency is phenomenal. We as an audience see your soul in your eyes and kind and thoughtful words. No wonder you are all mentors. So inspiring. Goodness. Thank you. So any other further thoughts from you or from the from our panelists? Well, you know, I want to say something about Debbie's comment. Was it Debbie? Um, yes. Transparency. You know, when we, the older we get, it seems like we tend to cloak ourselves in defenses and protection and our, our mask about who we are and our mask, are these masks that we wear. We want to be seen as this or seen as that. We want to please this person or that person. And, um, it's so ironic because as a psychologist, I learned what worked was more transparency. Now that's not the same thing as I focus on me, you understand. It's I come into it with an open heart um, and meet someone in that place. And the things I do, I do try to do with an open heart. And I think that's just such a, just a brilliant way of putting it. Uh, I want to just thank her for using those words because people are more comfortable when they feel like you're being transparent. And it's okay, by the way, and it helps some of the risky situations to be able to say, hey, you know, you seem really like I'm not doing what you want right now. Can we, let's figure out. Or, you know, I'm really, um, I am so blessed to be with you in this moment. I mean, transparency of all kinds, you know, taking off the mask. Hey, in the third act, the third set, that's what we do. We take off all these masks that we've been putting on all our lives. See, if we're lucky, we get down to something like our face. Well, as Donna says, so much heart, wisdom, and good information in this presentation. Thank you, Louisa and panel members. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity, Lee. Thank you, Leadership Bluegrass, creating so many wonderful mentorship kinds of things and uh, and IBMA. All right. Thanks to all. Thanks for uh, for everyone's participation. And we will lots of lots of glowing comments coming into the to the uh, to the chat, Louisa and panelists. I hope you're seeing that. Um, and uh, stay tuned for our, our final virtual workshop of the season on April 16th. Same. Uh, same time, same channel. Well, no, different channel, different Zoom link. Uh, and that will be Finding Peace, Music as a Wayfinder for Grief and Loss, which I think is going to be a good follow-up to, to today's topic, to be honest. All right. Thanks, everyone.